Good morning, folks. It's a Nova Science kind of day. We've also got notes on the weather, earthquakes, Mars, and of course, we're starting with our star over at spaceweathernews.com to find the last 24 hours on the sun here mostly quiet. The northern active regions remain the type of small and non-flaring groups expected at this early stage of the sunspot cycle. Not much in the way of coronal holes either, and as we come to the solar wind, we find the descent out of the stream from the last coronal hole has now completed. All telemetry back in normal range and geomagnetic conditions all quiet in the green. Always great when the top seismic pressure release of the day is well out to sea, here far from the reach of people on nearby islands. Top weather event goes down under, snow. It's the first time snow has fallen on the region in 30 years. For those in the northern hemisphere, August in the southern hemisphere is like our February here in the north, sometimes a bitter end to winter even a few months after the solstice. Let's go to Mars next, where the nightside atmospheric cooling and compression forces chemical interactions near the top of the sky, and they produce an ultraviolet night glow. This is not tremendously different from Earth's night glow, except Earth's is really green. The green here is more for visual aid. Wavelengths outside the visible range don't actually have colors. The more intriguing Mars study, however, details the internal structure of the planet from the seismic waves detected by the lander. They now believe the crust of Mars is 22 miles thick. Below that is an olivine-rich mantle, just like the Earth. Then, around 700 miles down, there's a mantle chemistry boundary where the Wadsleyite becomes more prevalent. And then, just short of a thousand miles down, you finally get to the core. Up next, folks, stars and their greatest outputs. We'll begin sub-Nova class, actually, with carbon stellar wind from late-stage red giant stars. The stronger they pulse in the visible light spectrum, the more carbon they are actually spewing out into the universe. This is one of the most extreme versions of metallic elemental production in sub-Nova space events. But we're going to step up to that Nova level next, because they're finding one so rich in calcium, it challenges the model of how it's actually working out there in the M100 galaxy. The new record holder for most calcium-rich supernova comes with some questions for their models. And speaking of questions for the models, the core collapse scenario has a problem. It's all about the equations to get to the initial mass function of the system. The observations only appear to have been in line with the models until this closer examination. Now, they've got a physics problem, and it applies to the biggest kinds of supernova. And speaking of which, one of the most long-lived Nova brightness events with a more than five-year peak as the shockwave interacted with surrounding gas and dust has come in now having well exceeded the hypernova mark of 10 to the 50 ergs of energy. This is that line where major stellar explosions begin to really shape the corners of the periodic table, the seeds of the next generations of stars being planted. And let's take an opportunity to see where that and other events fall on the cosmic blast scale, including the solar micronova we expect. This is from chapter 8 of our book, and while in reality I could have added the super flares from red dwarf stars somewhere around the micronova or X-ray burst lines, I really did want to keep it to the solar events and the nova. Indeed, there are numerous types of nova in space that are well smaller than what I envisioned from the sun, and in fact, even the higher power X-ray burst from pulsars, which would fry the entire solar system, has the smallest of nova-like ejections, wouldn't even reach Mercury. The sliding scale for these blasts is crazy, but the solar micronova doesn't sit on the farthest side of any such scale. Last but not least, an interesting look here at aluminum-26 to try to understand the formation of the solar system. This gives us an opportunity to come back to the role that aluminum-26 plays in understanding the great events after the solar system formed as well. The main point we try to make is that we get the microtectite glass beads, plant fossils, and the bones of animals in surge deposits, often dated to the times of the cyclical major disasters, and they contain not only aluminum-26, but nova-produced transuranic elements as well, some with half-lives in the centuries or millennia range, which means a nova must have produced them nearby and after the formation of the solar system. They would have decayed and not still be around if they were produced before our solar system was made, if it was from a faraway nova, it would have taken too long for the isotopes to arrive here, and again, the half-life issue comes into play. However, if it was from a nearby supernova after the solar system formed, the planets would be destroyed, the solar system would be destroyed, and therefore we're looking at something slightly smaller, 
a micronova from our sun. We greatly appreciate your support. 20% off sale at otf.sales.com continues during what would have been the conference weekend. All of our books, hats, running low on everything else actually. As always, you can catch up on our top videos at suspiciousobservers.org. We've got your wind maps and shots of our star to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now, it's 5.15 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.